Welcome back to Inside City Hall. While overall crime in our city remains at historically low levels, there's been a persistent concern about safety in our city's public housing developments. Earlier today, the de Blasio administration announced a series of changes aimed at identifying residents who pose a serious risk to public safety. Shola Olatwaye is the chair and CEO of the New York City Housing Authority. She joins me now with some details. Welcome back to the program. Good to see you. Thank you for having me, Errol. My understanding is that there was always, a, 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 or for a long time, there had been a policy on the books of uh, circulating names of people who, because they were had been convicted of, of certain crimes, could not be in public housing. What has changed now? What are we doing? So I think what we what what we have done, what today represented, is really um, the public showing of the work that uh, NYCHA, our colleagues at, at NYPD and the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice, really focused on how do we keep our residents safe. Um, there have been multiple investments by this administration, from lighting to community centers to CCTVs, and you know, really, what are the tools as a landlord that we have to ensure public safety is a, it remains a priority for our residents. So what we talked about today was a couple things. One, to really streamline uh, and create a single point of contact of information between NYCHA and the police department. Look, in best efforts, there was a ton of information floating around from PD to NYCHA at developments with really no consistent form, not even in electronic form. And this was, this was really, you know, it really did not help us uh, identify and or prioritize our resources, our focus and attention. So the first thing is a centralized single point of contact database between NYPD and NYCHA um, of, of any uh, potential cases. That's one. The second point is a priority of those cases. Look, we have something like 5,000 uh, uh, offenders cases that happen every year. And so the ability to really target our efforts and resources on those cases that pose the most um, an imminent risk to the life and public safety of our residents is what we need to do. So we're working very closely with PD to, to, to do that. So, so yeah, and f f clarify this for me, because if somebody, let's say I'm making this up, mm -hmm. if somebody um, was involved in check kiting or something like that, some white collar mm -hmm. fraud mm -hmm. in, a, in a way that had nothing to do with, uh, with the housing authority, could they still be excluded? Is it simply the fact that you have a, 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 an offense on your record, what gets you excluded? No, actually, you know, the, the permanent exclusion uh, program, which is what you're referencing, is actually about saving tenancy. It's really uh, targeted to an individual who is convicted of uh, a series of very serious offenses. So um, I, white collar crimes like check writing probably would not uh, would not uh, extend to that. But it's really focused on the individual or the perpetrator of the potential act to ensure that the family of of, of, of record can actually stay in the home. So what we have done, um, and actually our, our, our numbers have, have gone up because we've really sort of taken a real hard look at those, um, those cases uh, and, and, and we, what we need to do now in this sort of new environment is to ensure that we are prioritizing those cases that PD has also said so, so are just, a real I mean, issue. Just, just to clarify this, mm -hmm. if, if there's somebody who is um, a, a violent, excludable uh, a, a person uh, and they are found living in the development, that lease can be terminated and that can hurt a lot of people who might uh, on some level be innocent, right? Well, the first thing we do is um, act to permanently exclude the offender. And then, and that can only happen with the permission of the, the family or, or the tenant in, in, in rec on record. Um, and if that, and once that happens, um, if that person is found to be on the premises, again, and it is just the apartment, if that person is found to be on the premises again um, and in violation of that order, um, we can proceed with further um, tenancy actions so against the family of record. What if the leaseholder doesn't want to cooperate? So and, that's, and that's one, of, one of these sort of really challenging areas. Um, we then, and I think again with these new sets of reforms, um, making sure that we have all of the information that PD also has will help us build a case um, to not only permanently exclude uh, 
uh, permanent exclude or receive, get a uh, trespass notice, to ins which is another tool that we have in our, in our toolbox um, to ensure that that person um, isn't jeopardizing the health and safety of our residents. Mm -hmm. So yes, first and foremost, it is about ensuring that the family of record can stay in their home. And so that's why we need them to first sign off on the permanent exclusion. If not, we will pursue all other avenues to ensure that that person is not there. And, and this um, would apply to some, someone who is permanently excluded. Can they be on the grounds of a NYCHA property? And I, I ask that because a lot of them have really open sort of formats. I'm thinking about the Fulton houses. I, I cut through there all the time. Absolutely. I mean, depending on where you're going, yeah. it's just faster. Yeah, so what, this is one of those those sort of challenges, which is the permanent exclusion um, program really is specific to the unit, to the apartment. Um, if uh, and so, if that person is found at the unit, yes, they can be they can be arrested, they can be removed from the property. Um, if they're found on the grounds, um, there really isn't within our toolbox a means by which to to expel them. But again, going back to this increased information sharing between police and, and NYCHA, if that um, potential, that alleged offender um, has other issues on, on their record, this is where you know, really our, our uh, colleagues at PD can mm -hmm. come in, do their job, and, and remove the person from the premises. Let me shift to a related question. The Manhattan Institute recently put out a report um, looking at the, the 15 developments that you had targeted. Uh, these were high crime areas and you had a lot of special focus on them. Mm -hmm dealing with scaffolding, uh, extra, uh, extra policing, and so forth. And they found, they, they looked at it and they said there was a 25% drop in murders and 13% drop in shootings at those 15 developments, but, they, but, but that both crimes were up slightly in the rest of the developments. Mm -hmm. And the suggestion uh, is almost that if you don't want to just kind of play whack-a-mole and just kind of, right. you know, hopscotch around the place, right. does what you did in those 15 developments need to become the norm system-wide? Well, look, I think the first, the first thing was to, to really focus our, our in the city's uh, uh, efforts on those 15 developments that represented 20% of the city's major or violent, or violent crimes, and that's what we've done. And I think, you know, for the residents, that's ultimately why we do this. Do they feel safer? Do they feel that their public pedestrian areas are lit, that there are CCTV systems, that they see men and women from NYPD patrolling the grounds, that their children have places to go in, in the late afternoon hours? I think that's, those are uh, in indices of, you know, is the program a success? I'll leave it to the social scientists to sort of talk talk more specifically about, um, about other areas, I think there's no question that when you talk to residents, they want to see and have, um, they want to see more members of MIPD in their developments. They want, um, they're, they're concerned about um, violent crime that's happening in their neighborhood, and they want to be partners with police and NYCHA to ensure um, that their communities are safe. So this is, this is an evolving and dynamic process, and I know that um, the mayor and the police commissioner are, are, are focused on a real comprehensive approach to public safety and public housing. The, the, the plan itself, the action plan for neighborhood safety, mm -hmm. um, will it remain in place or is it over at this point? No, it's still in place and mm -hmm. there's there's active work that the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice is doing um, on, on really trying to measure and I think trying to really provide some of the quantitative uh, analysis to support the expansion of the program. Um, but but this is certainly, I think we've learned, I mean, we sort of know when we see it, right? You know, if it's dark, it should be light. If there, we should have greater CCTV cameras and, and other, and other you know, better doors, et cetera. And that's why not only through the mayor's action plan for neighborhood safety, but um, the district attorney's resources that we've also received in, from the asset forfeiture dollars. Um, we have eight of those projects are underway. I was just at the polo ground and lighting is being installed there. So, you know, there's no question that there are things that we can do as a landlord to ensure that our grounds are safer. I think the package of reforms that we talked about today are really uh, specific to our role as a landlord in the tenancy action and having better information from the police department, um, really acting in a much in a much more efficient way so that when we receive that information, NYCHA is acting within a week as opposed to a year um, is, is really critical. Okay, we're gonna leave it there for now. We'll be watching the numbers and uh, we wish you the best of luck with what is a, a very important initiative uh, to keep tenants safe. Thank you. All Thank you, right. Al. We're going to take a short break now. When we come back to the program, I'll be talking about the debate over Airbnb's place in our city. I'll be joined by city council members Helen Rosenthal and Jumani Williams. 
Later on tonight, Curtis Lewa and Herson Barrero weigh in on the Sheldon Silver guilty verdict and the other big political corruption trial that's still going on in Lower Manhattan. Stay with us.